Thank you very much, Dan. So we're going to start. So panel two is gendered environments and sexualized violence in the Canadian security sector. So I'll do a quick introduction. Sure, I'll, I'll bring it closer to me. Um, so it feels like every week there's a new sexual misconduct scandal that makes the news. Um, no institutions have been spared. Of course, we all know about the Me Too movement, the movie industry, Silicon Valley, the Oxfam scandal that happened recently, and it also hit our very own Canadian security sector. There have been several reports of sexist mistreatments, bullying, and harassment to female members of the Canadian Armed Forces and the RCMP, the Royal Canadian Military Police, in recent years. Steps have been taken to address recent critiques, and efforts have been multiplied to make the Canadian security institutions a welcoming environment for visible minorities. However, bringing about a change of culture in traditionally conservative and Bureaucratic institutions is probably the hardest things to do in any restru restructuring effort and resistance to change is bound to arise. We are very fortunate today to have two fantastic speakers that have spent their careers working for the Canadian Armed Forces and the RCMP and that will share with us their insight about the particularities of the military and the law enforcement cultures. So I will start by reading to you Barbara Fleury's biography. And so she is assistant commissioner and she has worked in law enforcement and the security sector for over 37 years. After completing a bachelor's degree in criminology, she joined the Royal Canadian Mounted Police in 1981 and has worked in operational and specialized policing roles with ever increasing responsibilities throughout her career. Over the years, she has worked on files involve, involving major crimes, drug trafficking, and corruption, as well as representing the RCMP in two international assignments to the United States. Assistant Commissioner Fleury spent seven years working with the international law enforcement community, first as the Director General of International Policing for the RCMP, and then as its police advisor to Canada's permanent mission to the United Nations in New York. In addition, she serves on the board of directors at the International Association of Chiefs of Police, the IACP, and as its international vice president in 2014 and 2015. In August 2016, she was promoted to the rank of assistant commissioner and is currently the executive director of the Canadian Police College and Center for Excellence in Police Leadership. In support of her role, she is currently on the executive board of the IACP, International Managers of Police Academy and Coll College Training. She is also a member of the Canadian Association of Chiefs Police and the Vice President of the Americas for Francopole. She is the recipient of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police Long Service Medal and Gold Claps and also received the Queen Elizabeth II Golden Jubilee Medal and Diamond Jubilee Medal. So very impressive. And now I'm going to present to you Nicole Bélanger. She's a Chief Warrant Officer. She enrolled in the Canadian Armed Forces and the Military Policewoman, graduating from basic training in Cornwallis in 1988. Um, so it's going to be really interesting to hear, hear the synergy between uh, Barbara and Nicole. So um, throughout her career, she has served in all three environments with postings all across Canada. So she's been to St. Jean, Borden, Cold Lake, Wainwright, Esquimalt, um, in Toronto as well, Winnipeg, Kingston, and Ottawa. So I don't know where she hasn't been, but she can tell us later on. Chief Foreign Officer Belanger has fulfilled a variety of policing positions during her career, including being selected as the first corporal to instruct at the Canadian Forces Military Police Academy. The majority of her career as an MP was spent as a criminal investigator, except the four years she spent in Jakarta, Indonesia, where she seconded to the Department of Foreign Affairs, Trade and Development as the mission security manager for the Canadian Embassy. 2011, she was promoted to her current rank of Chief Foreign Officer and appointed as the Air Force MP Group Formation, CWO. In 2015, Chief Foreign Officer Belanger was selected as the CWO for the Strategic Response Team on Sexual Misconduct, and in 2017, um, 
Chief Warrant Officer Bélanger was posted from Ottawa to 16 Wing Borden as the 16 Wing Chief Warrant Officer. So thank you both for being on this panel. We're, I'm going to be asking some questions um, during this panel to better understand how gendered environments have impacted Canadian security sectors and also to learn more about the organizational responses that were put forward to address inappropriate behaviors. So without further ado, I'm going to start by asking my first um, question. And I would like to know, so we all know that the environments of the armed forces and law enforcement are both traditionally male dominated. And I wanted to know in your experience, um, how do you think this has impacted the integration of women in, um, in those organizations? And I will give you about three, four minutes each to answer these questions. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. As uh, most of you know, you were expecting Rear Admiral Bennett, so you got the second stringer today, so I apologize for anything that I don't cover, but she will cover it tonight at the dinner, she promised me. Um, so the impact of integration on women in the Canadian Forces, um, today, about, today represents 50 about 51% of the population is women across Canada, but that is not reflective of the Canadian Armed Forces. So there's a propensity to join is factored into our recruiting. Um, and the military is still a very, very mysterious beast that society does not really know about. Um, so we have sort of that warrior mystique. And we're somewhat of a closed organization, uh, meaning that most of the public is unsure of what we do. So the integration of women to, to come into our organization, we need to get better at that communication piece, which we're trying with our recruiting. Because women don't understand um, postings, what it is for uh, to be a military member. When you know, when you ask somebody in society to define a soldier, what do they define? A male, right? It's not about males anymore. It's about the entire diversity of Canada, and we need to reflect that if we want to defend Canada and have you believe in us. And. And also there are certain occupations that are still not attractive to women. Um, being in the infantry, for example, um, they're physically, mentally demanding. And it, we have statistics and research to prove that women who want to join the military congregate towards six general occupations. Well, we want to um, really make sure that we have a broad cross-section across all our occupations in the Canadian Forces. So again, we need to get better at integrating that. Now, you say, with all the publicity that the military has been getting lately, and we've had our Me Too moment as well, um, who wants to join? Exactly, who wants to join? So we need to break that down. So is it affecting our integration? Well, it's also affecting our recruiting and uh, our retention. So mm -hmm. it's a problem, and, and we've had this problem. This is not a new phenomenon for us. We, we've had this for a long time. Um, in the mid-80s, we started integrating more women into different uh, occupations, because not all occupations were open to women until 2000, when the last occupation opened. Um, there is one that's still not occupation and not open to women, but we have to take that up with God because it's the Roman Catholic priest. So um, he hasn't allowed us to do that yet. Um, but we have moved at lightning speed, and, that, and that's the point I want to get across. Um, since 2000, we are now seeing women in three-star positions, generals. We're seeing command female chief warrant officers. We're seeing all these women rise up because there are prerequisites to promotion. There, you know, it's not tokenism where uh, a, a woman, uh, if you join, you're just going to be advanced along the way. No, there are prerequisites to that. It takes a long time to develop the leadership skills that are required to lead an organization as big as ours and as complex as ours. So that tokenism piece doesn't come into play for us. And what happens is, that once these career paths are developed and they start to take shape, then we started to see legitimacy from our peers because we were doing the tough jobs. We were in there. But seeing is believing. And when, when other women in Canadian society can see women in themselves in the Canadian forces, that's going to assist in our integration. Those are those trailblazers that are out there that are just uh, burning up 
you know, the path of the Canadian Armed Forces and getting to the top. And eventually, we will see a chief of defense staff who is a female um, or a minority, uh, a visible minority. Um, but the, the biggest thing is um, we need to understand that there's, there's a difference, right, um, in sort of the diversity piece. So we've embedded it in our defense policy and strong, secure, and engaged. We're offering different career paths so that everyone can serve. And I think, you know, once we start rolling down that piece, then integration will, be, will become a non-issue for us. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the RCMI as well as WISE for, for the opportunity to be here. Uh, my father was a World War II veteran, so I think he would be very delighted to see that I'm here with you today. And I think it's quite an honor for me also to be next to a fellow law enforcement colleague as well. So wonderful opportunity. So in answering your question, uh, when you look at law enforcement, uh, it's, a one, uh, it's among one of the, a number of professions that are obviously traditionally male dominated. Within the RCMP, there have been advancements to have a more inclusive and diverse workforce. However, obviously we need to do more. In preparing for the discussion today, I had pulled out some figures uh, to give you a better understanding maybe historically how we're situated. Myself, I was involved in a targeted uh, national recruiting campaign about 30 years ago, and I'd like to see, I'd like to, to add that the, I think I saw the, the fruit of my hard work and labor in terms of the women that have uh, joined the RCMP and, and moved up the ranks. But about 20 years ago, about 12% uh, overall representation of female regular members, police officers, were at the RCMP. That increased um, to 20% in about 10 years. And today we have approximately 22% uh, in the organization. And while it is moving in the right direction, there are, the numbers have re leveled off recently, and so we have to continue to be vigilant in our effort to ensure diversity. Within this representation, I think it's appropriate to mention the appointment of Brenda Lucky as the new commissioner de de designate of the RCMP with her official appointment effective just last week. The first female to actually hold this post was Bev Bussin in 2006, as she was appointed an on an interim basis. So this uh, recent uh, appointment marks a significant time in, in RCMP history. Looking at women in leadership roles in the RCMP, as of January 1st, 2018, about 20.3% 20 of all commissioned officers are women. This is said to exceed the current labor market availability of approximately 15% for women for commissioned police officers in Canada. And the figure matches the labor market availability of all regular members combined. So while we are doing relatively well as it relates to women in leadership roles, we still have a ways to go. Uh, I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with the 30% solution, uh, something that was proposed by Linda Tar Whalen. And she previously served on the UN Commission on the Status of Women in the Clinton Administration. It was White House Deputy Assistant focusing on women's concerns under President Jimmy Carter. What she suggested is that the real start change starts to happen when approximately 30% of any group uh, is in a leadership in a uh, position of influence. So, oh, I'm sorry, I'll move up a little bit more. Is that better? Okay. Uh, so, so basically when you look at that, if you need about 30% in every group to change and influence change, uh, we still have a ways to go in terms of uh, that at the table. And like my colleague mentioned, uh, although in the RCMP, uh, when in 1974 women were uh, able to join as regular police officers, um, the doors were open to any of the fields and any of the domains in the organization. Obviously there were systemic barriers that existed and still exist today, and there are areas in the organization and pockets where there are very few, if any, women in those groups. So we have uh, been actively pursuing those sectors in particular to try to encourage more women to join them. Uh, I'll give you an example of some of the fact, as a matter of fact, in the media not too long ago, uh, you may have seen an article about the Air Marshals Program and uh, the recruitment uh, of our, our, our police officers to do those duties. Uh, a very, very physically demanding um, training uh, with a lot of technical skills involved and obviously um, the job entails you traveling basically all the time so those are two factors that, that make it uh, sometimes challenging uh, for women to join uh, so moving forward an area of particular focus uh, seems more strongly rooted in our recruitment efforts and the integration as I said of women in very specialized units that have been traditionally male dominated uh, I came across an article in the Ottawa Citizen just a few weeks ago that reported that women comprise just about 10% of police candidates in Ontario, and more than half of them fail the physical testing required to apply for the job. 
So some women have a harder time with the physical test than their male counterparts because the test emphasizes upper body strength. The article reported that about 80% of the men who passed the test compared to 45% of women. So even if we promote awareness and boost our recruitment efforts and get more women applying to police, become police officers, this does not mean that we will have more female police officers. In addition to recruitment campaigns and promoting awareness, internal processes must also be examined to help us gain meaningful ground on the topic of diversity in the workforce. The Ottawa Citizen article also reported on the Ontario Association of Chiefs of Police and asking the province to review testing protocols. So there is an appetite within law enforcement with respect to identifying any systemic barriers in the testing process and whether they accurately represent bona fide aspects of the job. Some will argue that any interference with the testing and selection criteria is somehow lowering the standard. And I think this is where we need to have the discussion and conversation about what constitutes an effective police force. I think it's safe to say that there are a few areas of policing that are dependent on upper body strength, but it is not a requirement in most areas of policing or in all aspects and complements of an operational unit. It is not easy to reconfigure traditional views on traditional ways of conducting operations. However, we need to keep in step with changes to support public safety. We need to broaden the way we look at supporting public safety and consider the very strengths we need to get the job done. The recruitment process needs to be more adaptable to the varied requirements of public safety, and I would consider that this is the very opposite of lowering our standards. And I make a comment on that in the context of there are certain situations where the advantage is a physical one, and there are other situations where the ability to negotiate and discuss and de-escalate is just as important, if not more so. And so I think it's a combination of all the skills that everyone brings to the table. Diversity, that is inclusive of gender, race, and ethnicity, is critical to an effective police force and in providing effectual service delivery to Canadians. Thank you. So now my second question, I wanted to know a bit more what you thought if um, the military and law enforcement cultures, because often we call them total institutions because you get posted, you leave, you live in those cultures all the time and uh, they also have strong values of obedience and authority. So if this had an impact on perhaps cases of harassment and uh, abusive behaviors that we've seen, so I wanted to get your thoughts on this, if this had an impact on what we've been seeing. Did, did you hear my question? Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> so I will uh, ask my question again and make, I'll make sure to speak loud, uh, close to the mic next time. So essentially my question is about military and law enforcement and we've seen that there are cultures that we call them total institutions because when you live in uh, on a posting or on a base, you always, everything happens there in that circle. And um, so I wanted to know if this had an impact on harassment cases we have seen and uh, abusive behaviors. And um, yes, so that's my question. I would say the short answer is yes, um, but I will preface that. Uh, the good news is we're not alone in the CAF on this issue. The bad news is we're not alone on this issue in the CAF. Um, I think it's happening everywhere. Um, so it's not just conducive to uh, law enforcement and the Canadian Armed Forces, it is conducive to society as a whole. Um, for the Canadian Armed Forces, w we sort of have this social aspect where our men and women work very, very closely together at all times. Um, and it requires that uh, interaction and integration that, that's paired so closely together. Then you add alcohol into the mix. Um, not so much prevalent today as it was in the 90s and, and um, where if you didn't go out for, uh, thank goodness it's Friday, you didn't get promoted. Um, so it lent, it lent itself to that culture. But this is not just a, a, a women's issue for um, you know, harassment and abusive behaviors within the CAP. This is, this is an all-encompassing uh, issue. It's everywhere and it happens to both men and women. And we did a survey for uh, Stats Canada that proved that um, in, in the Canadian Armed Forces, um, harassment and abusive behaviors were, men were more susceptible to them than the women. Now, you look at statistics and go, okay, well, the Canadian Armed Forces only has 16% women in the Canadian Forces, so naturally it's going to be higher. True. Um, but. The point is, it's still happening, and it's happening to everyone. So this is a cultural thing that we need to break. Um, 
and for us the StatScan survey uh, revealed that it's mostly, mostly, I don't say all, but mostly lower level behaviors that if they weren't con uh, corrected could lead into the more severe behaviors. And that's where we had to put our foot down. Um, because we are a hierarchical organization, uh, we find ourselves in, in um, sort of power relationships, right? Where, where one is always in power over the other and can use that, that position to harass, to abuse, to get things, there was a fear of retaliation, right? Uh, what happens if, if I tell? Um, the, the whole of the Canadian Armed Forces, yes, it's a total organization, and yes, we are built on you know, shared values of duty, loyalty, integrity, and courage, but we're also built on teamwork. That is the foundation of what the Canadian Armed Forces is, it's teamwork. So if a member is reporting on somebody else, are they still part of that team? And that was the culture that, that we have to break in. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to lie, it's still there in places, but that's where Operation Honor comes into effect. Um, our military women in our survey reported that um, the majority of their harassers and abusers were their supervisors. Our male counterparts reported that their harassers and abusers were their peers. So it shows that power struggle, right? And that's exactly what it is, especially in a hierarchical organization like, like ours and like the RCMP, where ranked means everything. Um, so, you know, to answer your question bravely, is it conducive to just those two environments? No. No, it's not. So yeah, I don't know that I can say that it's more conducive, but you know, we're also pretty cognizant that I've been, you know, when you talk about culture, I've been in this organization for over 37 years, so I'm a product of the organization and the influence that it's had on me from the day that I, I joined when I was, uh, well, 21. Uh, so, um, but having said that, I think it is certainly less acceptable uh, that it occurs in our workplace when we are the very people that the public call upon when they're facing abuse. And so, you know, I have to, it re reminds me, uh, I, I used to be the officer in charge of our professional standards out in British Columbia. Uh, there's about, there was about 5,000 uh, personnel there. And, you know, we faced all kinds of different allegations of code of conduct or criminal. And the ones that really, really uh, got to me on a personal level were when our own officers used their position of trust uh, in a way that, that uh, abused uh, individuals that were either vulnerable or coming to us for help and I think that is a critical component when you think about the role that we play and the importance uh, of that both internally to our own people but to the Canadian public that we serve. So if I can share my own reflections and experiences on what aspects potentially contributed to harassment and abusive behaviors within the culture of law enforcement. As I mentioned, law enforcement is traditionally obviously male dominated. It is also one that is hi hierarchical and that places a lot of emphasis, as I, you know, these are the same words we both wrote without even consulting, team dynamics, being tough, being able to handle yourself in difficult and threatening circumstances. Loyalty, trust, and obedience are also implicit within this environment. And our quality that directly support and contribute to the su success of our operational objectives. So as women, uh, we are most likely entering into this team dynamic usually as a minority. The presence, your presence can invoke attitudes within your unit that range from mutual feelings of camaraderie, acceptance, or tolerance. Unfortunately, through no fault of your own, it can also prompt harassment or abusive behaviors. Women coming forward to expose misconduct, and I say women, but I mean obviously uh, it includes uh, men as well in, in much of this context. Um, come forward to expose misconduct can be viewed as eroding this implicit trust that exists within the ranks and jeopardizing the strength of the team to operate as an effective unit. The scrutiny is not only placed on the person who is behaving inappropriately, but on the victim who is somehow being judged for not being tough enough, for going outside of the team, or for a long list of other perceived effects that only serve to obscure the real issue. Another obstacle that a complainant of discrimination or harassment may face is having to go through antiquated or overly bureaucratic and protracted processes in submitting or you know, uh, putting forward a, a complaint. These long and drawn out processes are not unique to the RCMP and exist in many large organizations. Even so, they contribute to the real challenge of victims coming forward. 
In this environment, any person would be faced with difficult decisions. They have to consider if they will end up in a worse situation or have to continue to work with a person or people who have behaved inappropriately. Once, a once they finally make the decision to come forward, they may not have the support of the team or the hierarchical structure that they're part of. If it's your supervisor who is behaving inappropriately, the chain of command is another obstacle that is unique to law enforcement and, other, and some other professions and, and other rank-based organizations. Sadly, not saying anything can perpetuate abusive behaviors and somehow give the impression that this type of comportment is acceptable. Hopefully, it is becoming clearer to many that coming forward has nothing to do with betraying loyalty to the team and that respect is an integral part of team dynamics, but it is the mutual respect of everyone on that team that's the most important. Thank you, and, and I, I think the two first questions really help sort of set, understand the culture and what has been happening. So now with my third question, I'd like to know more about um, so when this came out, uh, all these cases for Canada, it was really the, uh, for the Canadian Armed Forces, it was the Deschamps report when it came out, really um, the Canadian Armed Forces took a big response plan that they put forward. And same for the RCMP, both your organization put forward um, sort of plans to address sexual misconducts, and I would like you to talk more about um, these answers that were put forward. Thank you. You guys can hear me, right? I don't need to lean into the mic. I do need to lean in? Okay. Um, so, as I said earlier, this type of behavior is not a new phenomenon for us. In the 90s, we had an advisory board for women in the CAF when we started to open um, all, the, uh, all the trades to, to our women. Um, and we had victims coming forward even then. Um, and as a result, we opened an ombudsman off, uh, office in the 90s. Um, that withstood, but again, the problem was systemic, and if it wasn't bought in by leadership, um, coming from bottom up, top down, then it really just, we turned a blind eye. Um, We also developed this program called SHRP, uh, Sexual Harassment and Racism Prevention. And what we did there was, and that was in the 90s as well, because we, we had some issues. So we developed this program, and then we thought training fixes everything, right? Well, it doesn't, right? And we fired and forgot. So every year you would have somebody walk in who really didn't want to be there, and he'd stick in the video, and he'd say, okay, you're gonna get your SHRP training today. So then, afterwards, it became a big joke. Well, you can't say that because you've already had your sharp training. Or you can say, can say that because you've been sharp trained. So we fired and we forgot about it. Mm -hmm. and, and it lost its steam. Um, and then in 2014, we had our, we had our, me, uh, our me moment. And that was when Stephanie Rayon uh, came forward in the media in McLean's Magazine in L'Actualité. And she said, this is happening in the Canadian Forces. And we were taken aback. Because at one point, um, a year prior, we had done a survey and sexual harassment uh, was the lowest it had ever been in the Canadian Forces. So we figured we could put our assets someplace else. Uh, uh, in parallel to that, our court martial process in the so our military justice system had only try seven individuals for sexual assault in that entire year. So we thought we were doing really well. Well, she said we weren't. So we thought we were over here. Stephanie Rome says you're way over here and hopefully we were somewhere in the middle. Um, so uh, the CDS did something unprecedented for the day. He commissioned an, an external review um, and he hired Madame Deschamps, a former Supreme Court Justice, uh, to conduct that review for us. And it took seven months, and she interviewed over 700 people, um, and her mandate w was quite narrow, and to get to the bottom of what was going on in the Canadian Armed Forces, because obviously the leadership was out of touch with what was going on. Mm -hmm. um, so a month prior to her giving us her report, we knew it was going to be bad. So we stood up this uh, strategic response team on sexual misconduct. A month later, she gave us her report, and we knew it was bad, right? She made 10 recommendations, and I had the opportunity to speak to Madame Deschamps, and I said, why only 10? And she said, 
because I wanted you to action them. And does anyone know what her first priority was in that recommendation? Admit you have a problem as an organization. And we had never done that in the past. We had never as an organization said, we failed. We have a problem here. We gave it the bad apple theory. We put it off onto individuals, but we never said as an organization, we are responsible. And we did that this time. And that's why we have such a huge movement going towards Operation Honor. Um, so when she delivered her report, we then stood up that team um, to make sure that they had a CAF strategy and an action plan that went along with it. Um, and our action plan uh, went along four lines of operation, which was understand, respond, support, and prevent. And that was huge for us, right? Yeah, we understood it in the past. Did we support it? Not really. Were we preventing it? Well, it wouldn't have reared its ugly head if we had prevented it in the 90s. And, um, you know, were we supporting our members? No, and it goes back to the team thing, all right? So then, um, we accepted two of those recommendations in full and eight in principle. Then a new CDS come in in July of 15. And his first order to the Canadian Armed Forces, his very first order on his change of command parade was one thing, this stops now. Right. Meaning sexual assault and sexual misconduct and bad behaviors. Um, so then in August, he brought in all his general officers and his flag officers and his senior appointed chief warrant officers into one area. So all those people across Canada and abroad, and he brought them in to Ottawa and he launched Operation Honor. And when he launched that operation, he did it for a specific reason, because the Canadian Armed Forces, he made it an operation. And the Canadian Armed Forces has never failed on operations. We are very good at what we do when it's in an operation. So we've taken the best of our culture to attack the worst of our culture, which was happening to our members. So our members shouldn't have to defend themselves against our brothers and sisters in arms. And what he did was he made it into a language that is very conducive to a soldier. It is a language that we all understand, that we know when an order is issued, we will follow that order. So this stops now became very pertinent. And what he did was he made sure that all leaders were held to account. So if you didn't um, pass up the chain of command, something that was happening within your organization, you were then held to account for it. And in the past, what we did was we thought, you know, and, and I'm to blame for this as a senior NCO, I thought I fixed the problem. Well, I, for me, maybe I fixed it, but not for the victim. And, and I never bothered to ask, so shame on me. Um, you get smarter as you go. Um, and then um, in 2015 as well, in September, a few months later, we stood up the Sexual Misconduct Response Center. So that is an independent organization staffed with um, psychologists, sociologists, trained professionals to deal with victims of sexual assault and uh, sexual abuse. And it is independent of the chain of command. Which, which is huge for, for a, a military organization being independent. Um, people can call there at any time uh, and, and talk to, to trained um, psychologists, sociologists, and, and, and just have that ear because, you know, it, it takes a ton of guts to come forward, and when they finally do, they, they need somebody that they're able to talk to and that who knows what's going on and can guide them in the right direction. And the SMRC, the Sexual uh, Misconduct Response Center, is not just for our victims. It is for our chain of command, all right? We have a, a, a senior military liaison officer who is, who is embedded inside the SMRC who can answer questions from the chain of command as to policies and procedures and, and where to direct them if, if they need guidance. Um, then uh, in February of 2016, we launched our first inaugural uh, progress report. So we were answering to our, both our external and our internal um, stakeholders. We were letting them know exactly what was going on at the Strategic Response Team on Sexual Misconduct and what Operation Honor was doing because we had a huge hurdle to jump over, right? Which was getting our members to believe that we're gonna action it this time, because we've never done that in the past. 
So we followed that up with reports every six months. Uh, our stats can survey was released. Uh, the SMRC expanded to 24/7, and the progress reports made us made us accountable to the public. So what were some of the key areas, uh, or key focus, focus areas for us? Well, the first one was being victim support. We had to concentrate on the victim. Um, so with the SMRC, um, we also developed options for reporting. Because in the Canadian, Canadian Armed Forces, you are mandated by law to report an incident that you know has happened. So if somebody, uh, my best friend, discloses to me that they were sexually assaulted, I have to report that by law, right? Both NCMs and officers, which caused a conundrum for the Canadian Armed Forces. So the SMRC steps in, um, and they sort of have that third-party reporting, which really didn't exist in the Canadian Armed Forces. Um, the retaliation and fear of reprisal uh, piece. We took a stance on that, saying that anyone who is found to be threatening somebody else for uh, non-reporting or for reporting and then um, taking it out on them, not posting them, not promoting them, uh, generally affecting their career, well, the person that's doing that is the one that suffers today, not the victim, and that's good. Um, we're exploring victim liaison officers, uh, so options for that. Uh, exploring peer support programs. Um, so with our education and training, we have bystander and intervention training now, which has been already delivered to over 70,000 members of the Canadian Armed Forces. Uh, we run Respect in the CAF workshops, which have delivered over 10,000 of those. Uh, we have a mobile app for Respect in the CAF. We're embedding Operation Honor into programs, uh, qualifications, and standards from the time you join the Canadian Forces. So right at recruit school, you're being told what is acceptable behavior, what is unacceptable behavior, what we will tolerate, what we won't. Um, and we're uh, continuing specialized uh, professional development for our healthcare professionals, for our military police, and for our military prosecutors. Uh, we also focused on uh, complaints report and tracking because we never did that very well before. Um, what we did was a very crude hand data uh, reporting system if it got reported at all. Um, and sometimes within our, our own system for uh, reporting um, crimes. What, what do you call that again? Uh, in the crime stats. You know when they go in and log into the policing. I forget, I've been out of PC for a while. Um, anyway, um, they weren't being reported properly or they're being coded or downgraded to a lower level uh, type of assault. Um, that is all being changed and um, we've, we now have a fully standardized electronic system with business analytics built right into it. So we are capturing everything that is going on that's being reported inside the Canadian Armed Forces. We've updated and consolidated a lot of our policies because they didn't sing together. They, they weren't married. You would go to one, it would say one thing, you'd go to another, it would be something different, right? So now they're all under one umbrella. Um, and we, most importantly, we have tougher scrutiny on our perpetrators, meaning that there is now automatic career administrative action that goes along with um, being accused and being found guilty of uh, any sexual misconduct. Uh, for the military police, we have a military police liaison officer uh, embedded directly in the uh, sexual misconduct response center. Uh, this individual uh, will answer calls that uh, somebody might call and want to know about the judicial process. This individual can answer it. And when this individual was originally placed in, in within the sexual response team on sexual misconduct, he was a godsend because people who call and they call back and they get the same individual. So they didn't have to tell their story four, five, six, seven, eight times. Right? They, not everyone in their unit knew what was going on. And when they finally got the courage, or the to, to make a report, he was there for them. So he held their hands all the way through, and it was very comforting for these people. And his reputation got known, not only in the CAF, but across um, 
the, the civilian organization uh, and just 700 website um, for for this individual to come and, and um, really if, if you needed some advice go to him so that was that was a huge win for us um, we have our military police recruits and our returning supervisors now receiving sexual offenses victim support training um, the military police stood up 17 new positions called sexual offenses response team and they investigate only sexual assaults so they're similar to the criminal investigation division they're called our national investigation uh, service and they have 17 new positions that deal only with sexual assault and the more often you do them the more experienced you you become at them because sexual assault investigations sexual misconduct investigations are hard to do for a police officer Within our military justice system, the uh, Director of Military Prosecutions created this uh, team called SMART, which is Sexual Misconduct Action Response, and that brings specialized expertise and uh, best practices to deal expeditiously and efficiently uh, with complex cases of sexual misconduct. And for the first time ever, we've made legal advice available to victims, like other organizations. We never did that before. The only one who got advice was the person that was accused. The victim was, the victim, um, was left um, to their own devices. Um, we also focused on lessons learned and research. Um, so they're now being captured in writing and we're actually uh, implementing the lessons that we learned because it's not really learned if you don't implement it, right? And finally, our strat comms and our engagements, um, really transparent um, and not just with our external stakeholders but also with our internal audience because they're the ones uh, that need to know that we're there to take care of them that we've taken action and they need to trust uh, trust us that and you know it, it's hard to say trust me when you don't demonstrate any behaviors towards that trust so we now have demonstrated those behaviors and we will continue to demonstrate them so we've built a very dedicated team but we have an institutional focus this time, and we continue to re refresh the message. So that's just some of the things that we've done. Thank you. Tough act to follow, eh? <laughs> Uh, so, uh, like the Chief Ward Officer was saying, uh, the issue really is one that is not only complex, but that it has to be dealt with in a multi-pronged approach. And I think we've learned, uh, unfortunately, that the lessons of the past, uh, inoculating everybody by providing training is, not, is, is a very small, essential component, but certainly not the entire piece uh, when we look at some of these issues. So I'll briefly just address on a couple of things from the, the RCMP. One uh, is in terms of legislation legislation and in the in, in labeling le legislation so in 2014 the enhancing of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police Accountability Act was created came into force uh, the previous one uh, was 30 years old and it was a significant uh, change uh, the amendments allowed for basically updates to policies programs and structures for the harassment grievance and conduct processes I touched on briefly before one of the inhibitors was the lengthy bureaucratic processes that victims were often exposed to and so critical for us was to look at really you know two main elements one obviously is a prevention one one incident is one too many but the other piece is when it does occur how do we ensure that we have an environment where we make sure we have uh, victims who can go through a process that is expeditious that is fair and transparent and that uh, there is an end result uh, down the road that is not uh, years in the making so for instance the amount of time taken uh, to complete a conduct file has significantly improved under the new process in 2016 it took an average about 121 days to complete a conduct file, uh, which was a 34% improvement over the previous year. So with increased awareness and understanding of what constitutes harassment, by definition, and by effectively communicating the resolution process, we saw an increase actually in the number of complaints. Uh, but despite the increase, um, the complaints are being dealt with significantly faster. Uh, the average time to complete harassment investigations in 2016 was about 126 days compared to 270 in 2015. So the Accountability Act marked an important step towards our goal of becoming a stronger and more responsible uh, RCMP. 
Another important piece was uh, the Merlo Davidson um, uh, file. And much like you, you know, there are people and individuals who have the courage and the fortitude to step forward men, when many others don't, and they can influence change. I'm a firm believer in, in the power of one. And around the same time uh, that these efforts were going on in terms of uh, the legislation, uh, many of you may have already be aware of the Merlo Davidson lawsuit, which arose when Janet Merlo in British Columbia came forward in 2012 and when Linda Gillis Davidson of Ontario came forward in 2015. These two women who were members of the RCMP alleged they had been victims of discrimination and that the RCMP had failed them uh, in failing to exercise its responsibilities to ensure employees could work in an environment free of discrimination, intimidation, and harassment. Following discussions, the parties agreed to a settlement that provided for change initiatives within the RCMP to eliminate discrimination, bullying, and har harassment in the workplace. The settlement also provided for claims process and payment of compensation to members with claims as determined by an independent assessor, an independent assessor. The date of submitting claims under settlement expires this month. This month. So as I mentioned before, one harassment complaint is one too many. And the organization with the, the full support of the senior executive examined effective ways to ensure a safe and respectful work environment. Last year, the RCMP established a workforce culture and employee engagement unit led by a member of the RCMP senior executive committee to provide central guidance on diversity and inclusion related initiatives. In addition, this included the hiring of an expert to implement gender-based analysis plus competencies throughout the RCMP as a means of ensuring that all policies and programs are developed with a rigorous consideration of gender and diversity. GBA plus training has also been mandated for, all, mandated for all newly appointed executives or officers in the RCMP. I'll give you an example in my current capacity as the Executive Director of the Canadian Police College and Center for Excellence in Police Leadership. I have asked all my employees to complete the GBA training and to incorporate gender-based assessments into the courses and curriculum designs that we do. So in other words, I'm very proud to say that my management team is actually 75% women um, and that there are women instructors at all levels in the college. And the GBA, what I like about that is it is really a self-reflection uh, in terms of we all come to the table with biases. We all grow up and, and it's, it's uh, unavoidable. But what it does, it, it gives you the opportunity to reflect on that and to say, okay, am I giving examples in my classrooms that reflect everybody in diversity of opinion and diversity of operating? So it is an effective tool to influence whether that's what we're saying, who we're picking to instruct, and who we're picking to lead in terms of influencing the future generation of law enforcement. Uh, the workforce unit is also responsible for engagement with diversity employment equity committees and developing a cohesive evidence-based approach to advancing gender equality and cultural change over the long term. Relying on evidence-based approaches is, in my mind, vital to the topic of gender equality. It forces us to look beyond our own personal stories or individual experiences. The RCMP created 17 gender and harassment advisory committees, each chaired by divisional commanding officers and the commissioner to provide advice to the RCMP on matters involving gender, sexual orientation, harassment, equity, and inclusivity. Many of the divisional committees have already met with their respective commanding officers with annual reports for these committees to be prepared and released sometime this year. The RCMP has also created a post-secondary scholarship program of up to $5,000 annually to recognize college or university students for anti harassment efforts in their schools or communities. The program is named after Troop 17, the first female troop of RCMP officers to train at the RCMP Academy. In addition, we supplemented existing training on bias awareness and implemented new training on inclu inclusive leadership for all levels of executives, officers, managers, and supervisors. These and other initiatives were added to already established programs that support a respectful and inclusive workplace such as the RCMP's mental health strategy and action plan, respectable, respectful workplace training, informal conflict management programs, violence prevention policy, and the centralized office for the coordination of harassment complaints. These are a few examples of what the organization is currently engaged in and committed to its employees to um, reduce and hopefully eliminate uh, these type of issues in the workplace. Thank you both for your answers, and I think it's really important to hear this. Um, so, um, however, time flies, and I really want to hear the questions from the audience. So perhaps I'll ask a quick question, however, after I would like to invite people to come to the microphone. And you both have 
90 seconds to answer my question. <laughs> my question is, what do you think are going to be the main challenges that your organization will have to face to tackle sexual mis misconduct and uh, abusive and inappropriate behaviors? You have 90 seconds. Go. Uh, the first one being culture change. So our organization spans in age from 16 to 65 and it changes daily, right? Members come in with different values and we need to inculcate the shared values of the CAF with that. So culture change will be a huge one. Uh, performance measurement. Uh, how do we demonstrate success? Uh, what does success look like? Um, and, and you know, at this moment we're building the airplane as we fly in because there's no time for a strategic pause. There's no time uh, or luxury to, to come up with solutions. We have to do it on the fly. Expectation management and skepticism is another challenge for us. We have huge public scrutiny because the public holds us to a higher standard, or at least um, that's the way we perceive it. And constant scrutiny uh, always overrides praise in an organization. Uh, and finally, uh, uh, statistics and data. Uh, we're always being asked for numbers and reports, uh, but they don't tell the whole story. And until our survivors and our victims come forward, we don't know what we don't know. Yep. You get the extra 30 seconds. Well, oh, thank you for that. I much appreciate it. <laughs> um, well, I guess I look at it and say, what are the main challenges? Um, maybe I, I can say that I, you know, on a more personal level to answer the question in 90 seconds than my notes here, is that uh, I'm either an optimist or a pessimist, I'm a realist. And, and I say that in the context of having grown up in this organization, I think, like I said before, uh, one thing is uh, one person at a time, one leader at a time and their influence and their ability to make sure it doesn't happen on their watch and their team and in their, in their offices. I think that now more and more so individuals recognize that it's it's not about checking the box. It's actually about firmly believing that everyone brings something to the table mm -hmm. and that we need to make sure that we're inclusive in our discussions, in our decision making. It makes us stronger when we have different minds who think different ways to solve different problems of the future. Policing is getting more and more complex. We need to make sure that we bring people to the table that grew up differently than we did, that think differently than we are, to make sure that not only we serve the populations that, that are out in Canada and around the world, because I'm also a firm believer that we have a lot to bring to the world in terms of democratic policing principles, but also the fact in terms of an organization that we respect and trust each other because the work is difficult. We need to support each other constantly in what we do, and it's not going to get any easier. So I look at the young uh, recruits in our academy, and uh, I'm inspired by them, that by their willingness to take on the huge challenges that will face them in the future, and that if they all stand together, we're much stronger. So it may sound a little bit uh, anecdotal, but... Uh, that is one of the challenges to make sure that we support each other in the work we do. Thank you very much. So I will entertain the first question. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the uh, chair and both speakers for a very uncomfortable presentation. Um, I'm a white middle-aged male who served in uniform throughout the period uh, during the long litany of improvements. Um, and I can only suggest that we're on a downward escalator and we have to keep running hard to avoid hitting the bottom. Uh, I teach now at the Royal Military College and I would like to ask a question that is often raised by some of my young lady cadets. Mm. Are women harder on each other than men are? And if that is the case, as we succeed in increasing the number of women in our organizations, are we actually going to find tougher barriers for women. They've achieved an awful lot in a fairly short period of time. I was a fourth year cadet when the first uh, cadets, lady cadets came to RMC. Um, we've had huge strides with some very impressive young women leaders. But if they're harder, if the, it is true that they are harder on each other than men are on them, um, are we going to face tougher barriers in the future. I'd be very interested in your perspective on that. Sure. Uh, thanks for the question. Actually, I, I'd be interested in seeing actually some, some studies in terms of the evidence of that. Um, but I do have to reflect on, on my own career and wondering that 
maybe years ago when there was only one that you want to make sure that that one succeeded because if that one didn't succeed what would be the impact on the group or the future people coming through um, but as more and more women are in those units I think that that issue becomes less prevalent uh, and I'd like to think that while I have always tried to encourage both men and women that I see who have ca capabilities to move forward um, that I you know I have to look at myself in the mirror and say have I been harder because I want to make sure they succeed so that if there is a doubt and somebody's kind of on the border and you're in a promotion review do you push them forward or not and I'd like to think honestly that um, uh, that's not the case uh, that uh, we are our, our desire to make sure that the best people succeed regardless of their gender move forward in the organization and we mentor equally both um, I would echo that sentiment. Um, I think there was a time where we were harder um, on uh, our female counterparts, and it had a little bit to do with the Queen Bee theory, uh, whereby if I'm going to put my name towards you, then you better be as good as I am, because if you fail, then it's a failure on my part. Mm -hmm. um, so th there was a little bit of harshness there. Is it happening today? I'd like to think not. Uh, and, and I think w what we need is to make sure that the best person gets the job regardless of whatever your sex is. Um, and, and if that's the case, then, then we actually do succeed. So it, you know, if somebody feels that we're being hard on them, then you know, maybe, maybe that's a discussion that needs to be had between the supervisor and, and that individual. And now, um, with more women going up into senior positions, um, there's a lot more room for mentoring as well. Because mentoring didn't happen back when, when I was a young um, you know, corporal and that. There were just no women there to mentor me. Um, so you, you had male mentors. Um, but now, and again, it goes back to that seeing is believing, you can see yourself in the organization. So when you see yourself, do you want to uh, aspire to be that individual? And, and it becomes a mind thing as well, right? How do you get there? Um, go talk to that individual. What did, what did you have to do to get there, you know? And, and that mentoring piece takes over. So I would like to think that no, we are not harder on one sex over the other. We just want the best candidate for the job. All right, we will take um, the second question, so Charlotte. Hi, um, my question is for you, Chief Warren Officer Ben Angers. So I really appreciated your discussion of sexual misconduct and how the CAF really evolved from that. So then I have a question regarding the Me, the Me Too moment that you mentioned in 2014 and the fact that CDS Hillier didn't really um, move forward we had to wait until um, CDS Vance came to his position to have operation on her and also regarding the fact that in 1988 there was three cover issues of McLean's regarding rape in the military forces to what extent do the addressing of sexual misconduct on the institutional level in the CAF depends on the leadership and so the following question on that is also, what do you think is going to happen when CDS Vance is going to finish his, his term because it's upcoming? Do you think that the culture has changed enough for progress to continue in such a positive way as we have seen in the past four years? Thank you for that question because it gives me an opportunity to clarify myself. Um, CDS Lawson actually did um, take steps and he accepted in principle two of the ten. Now, some of those recommendations, it took time, and again, it goes back to we're, build, we're flying the airplane as we're building it, so he was a, just a little bit more cautious, right? And keep in mind, CDS Vance, um, when he come in, he had a little bit more time to digest the information, and, and yes, and you know, he was very proactive. Is it is what we've done strong enough to withstand uh, a leadership change? I believe so. I think, uh, you know, we're in that cultural change now where uh, our, our older members who didn't believe that uh, women had any place in the Canadian Armed Forces, well, through attrition, we, we've gotten rid of most of them and, and others because we made it an operation, know that you better get on the line or you're, you're out. Right? And the CDS has made no qualms about it. He will kick you out. 
Uh, and he has picked out several senior officers and several senior chiefs for not doing their job with regards to Operation Honor. So I think if you look at it from a change aspect, like a change theory, uh, where are we are we over that hill enough? I believe we are. And and this is a cultural phenomenon now because what this does is it re it reflects who we are as an organization. And don't forget, we're also Canadian citizens. Right? Every military member who serves in the Canadian Armed Forces is a Canadian citizen. We might not be a civilian when we're wearing this, but we are citizens of Canada, and we hold the same values that you do, so we want to uphold those. So my short answer is yes, it will withstand any leadership because we have now bought into that, and because it became a focused institutional priority, it, it's going to withstand anything. I hope that answers your question. All right, being cautious of time, I will take the next two questions. So um, what we're going to do is I'm going to ask you to both ask your questions and then the panelists will finish with the answers. So, so very quickly. <laughs> so I will take the three questions and then our panelists are going to close up. We have about six minutes. Well, now recognizing that we're counting down to break, I'll be very brief, uh, Chief and Barbara. Um, recognizing that the intent of this this um, session was to address specifically gendered environments in the security sector and sexual violence, we tend to focus on victimhood. But I wonder if you can take us the step beyond that and talk about the steps uh, being taken underway in both of your respective respective organizations around empowerment and mm -hmm. turning women into agents of change within your organizations. Thanks. Uh, hi, I, I have a bit of a follow-up question uh, to the question that was asked at this mic. Uh, Chief Warrant Officer Belanger, you talked in, uh, and thank you for both of your talks, by the way. They were both fascinating. Um, I, I was struck by one of your comments. You were, you were describing that now members of the Canadian Armed Forces will experience very real career and administrative consequences when they, um, are, when they are found guilty of having committed acts of sexual violence, harassment, but I am worried about the institutional... Sorry, I didn't say harassment. Okay, sorry, Viol oh, misconduct, sorry. Um, <laughs> I am worried about the the long the institutional longevity of that that those serious consequences which I, I, I are also up against the culture of teamwork that you described a culture that from both descriptions the type of total organizations that you're involved in uh, th these are hundreds of years right of that that kind of norm and value that you don't violate the team How, I'm worried about the institutional longevity of these changes and the extent to which you may eventually, when you lose the buzz and the support of the current leadership, you might see it begin to disappear and dissipate. I work in a university. 30 years ago when I started my career, we had a sexual harassment education and support center. We had an anti-racism center. 10 years ago, these were all quietly folded into human rights offices that didn't really have the same kind of teeth that those original offices had. We thought we had solved the problem. And then several years ago, in the midst of a sexual assault case, we didn't even know where to send uh, the, the survivor of that, of that assault. So I, I think large institutions, especially, you know, again, you're up against the, uh, the, the, the years and years of that, you don't violate the norm of teamwork. And you've brought in processes that have real material consequences. And how do you keep that going? when this current buzz and attention dissipates a bit in the next five to ten years. I'll just make one comment before I answer that. Um, I would say the perpetrator violated the teamwork aspect. Okay. And then the last question. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, as you know, we're from Ukraine and uh, uh, some background, just uh, one minute, and uh, and our question. This question very important for us because uh, we also have and uh, sexual violence in the army, and also have many another problems. Um, as you know, in 2014, Russia began a war in Ukraine, and Russian troops occupied our territories. And from the very first days. 
uh, our uh, war, uh, our women joined to Ukrainian volunteer movement and volunteer battalions and also um, Ukrainian legislation didn't allow women to be assigned to combat positions and this position was closed and so they were enlisted as cooks and uh, seamstresses, cleaners and others but in fact in front line they were snipers and um, grenade launcher operators, reconnaissance soldiers and other intelligence other other and it's uh, in uh, one side it's very funny uh, but in really in reality it's not funny it's a big problem and um, the contribution of uh, women to defense of the country was and still is invisible in society our society and uh, i'm like a also demobilized female veteran i am and also leader of the um, civil society organization institute of gender program i um, launched a research initiative to analyze women participation in the our front line an invisible battalion project and advocacy campaign include a number of visibility events including a presentation of the research results and photo exhibition of women in uniforms um, and uh, in addition to raising awareness the campaign resulted uh, in uh, significant legislative changes in 2016 that opened 63 combat positions uh, that were previously prohibited uh, for women and a documentary film also to heroines here invisible battalion uh, through joint advocacy efforts with civil society organizations and members of parliament, the campaign has continued to advocate the adoption of draft law and uh, on equal rights and opportunities for men and women during military service to open an addition to 200 military positions prohibited for women as well as for equal access of uh, men and women to military education we continue the our advocacy campaign and uh, try to reintegration and rehabilitation female veterans by raising awareness about their challenges and needs but uh, i'll just ask unfortunately you to, uh, yeah to but unfortunately uh, our members of parliaments and also our government they don't understand these problems in general and uh, you have this way have this way you step by step um, have some uh, some uh, success in this process for us very interesting your experience your specified steps what must we do in to um, to focus our government to these problems problems with positions with legislation with uh, sexual harassment and another and other problems because it's also our right to protect our country thank you so I will, if you want to summarize, and your so maybe two minutes each tops. Um, so I'll go to your question. Um, you know, empowerment of the institutions. Uh, oh no, that was sorry, Collins. Yeah, empowerment of the institution. Uh, you know, I think uh, just by the bystander intervention training, by um, having our women step forward and, and come out and talk about it, um, you know, standing up in front of groups and, and being able to talk, and our peer support program um, that, that we're looking at, I, I think we have empowered our women, and we will continue to empower those that are, that are victims and survivors of sexual assault or sexual misconduct. Um, with regards to your point, um, I, I would suggest that, again, the perpetrator has broken that, that true bond of teamwork. And in today's society, we know that it's, 
inappropriate behavior. Um, at this point, you should understand what the shared values of the CAF are, which are duty, loyalty, integrity, and courage, and, and that comes out in our military ethos, which is what makes us us, and in our ethics program, where we respect the dignity of all, not just those that are on the, uh, the out group. So it is that individual, and I've seen a change over the years where you'd be in a class and somebody would make a sexist joke, and you know if one person had the courage to stand up and say, hey, that's not okay, the whole group turned on that one person, right? And what did we do? We wrapped our arms around the perpetrator. And, and that, that set, sent a very strong message. And today that message is, you know, you know what? The one person that stands up, we're going to salute them because that is what right looks like, and, and we're going to hail them as heroes. Thank you. Um, I can't answer that question. <laughs> okay. Maybe over drinks. Okay. <laughs> Um, just to wrap up, and, and the commonalities, I'm not wearing my uniform today, but certainly women in uniform and, and men in uniform and the commonalities of organization kind of stand out today in comments. And perhaps I'll just take a, a brief comment in terms of our, our colleagues uh, from Ukraine, is that uh, when women first joined the RCMP, it was because an outside group influenced that decision. And when you look at civil society, and you look at members of parliament, and you look at this table here, the ability to shape and influence uh, our organizations as we come, become more and more transparent. So in terms of power as well, you, you, you all have a role to play in making, you know, ensuring that we're accountable for our actions and ensuring that we're creating organizations uh, that provide openness uh, to everybody to be part of. And, and a final note, I think, uh, if I can speak for you as well, is that it's the importance about as we move forward, um, I'm confident as well that it's not a change of leadership that will, will uh, influence uh, that so much as it is uh, a movement forward whereby we'll no longer be talking about men and women, uh, we'll be talking about everyone and ensuring that everyone is uh, in an environment that provides them the ability to serve uh, the best that they can. Merci.